Good morning. I'm Rabbi Raish Weiss, and on behalf of Natick Interfaith Clergy, it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to our communal celebration of the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. It's appropriate that we should come together today for prayer and thanksgiving, as not only was Dr. King a pastor of immeasurable faith, but faith pulsates every social justice and civil rights movement in our country. It is only natural that so many of these mo movements have been led by leaders of faith. Dr. King had a dream, a dream we all know so well, but we have yet to see that dream fulfilled. Our local public school system witnessed all too recently its own spate of racist incidents. And on a national level, we witness ongoing widespread and systemic efforts to suppress voting rights, disenfranchising and marginalizing the most vulnerable members of our society from participating in our nation's most treasured democratic act. Sadly, more than half a century after King, Dr. King's assassination, we find that our nation is more divided than ever, that basic human and civil rights are more threatened than ever, and that the ugliness of racism and discrimination are at a dangerous precipice. As people of faith, though, we're neither det deterred nor discouraged. We're inspired by the words, spirit, and sacrifice of Dr. King. We lift our voices in the name of righteousness in the hope that truth and justice will prevail. In this spirit, dear friends, let us be resolute and vigilant in our communal pursuit of justice. May we know true hope. May our time together this morning inspire us to walk with Dr. King spiritually, hands in hand with one another in the collective quest for freedom and equality for all. Good morning, everybody. Welcome again. I'm Michelle Murata from Spark Kindness, and I'm here with my colleague, Elizabeth Nolan Greer. Another warm welcome to everyone today. Spark is honored to be among the MLK Day planning partners, including the Natick Public Schools, the Greater Natick Interfaith Clergy and Leaders Association, the Town of Natick, Natick Board of Health and Natick 180, Natick Metco, Natick is United, and Natick Pegasus. As I stand here welcoming you, I am inspired by the words of Yolanda Renee King, granddaughter of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King, during the recent unveiling of The Embrace, a historic monument to racial justice at the Boston Common, which I understand will be open to the public in early February. Like many of you, I'm sorry, excuse me, like me, many of you might have been following the coverage of this incredible and historic work. The sculpture of beautiful intertwined arms represents the King's embrace when they first learned that Dr. King won the Nobel Peace Prize. I loved learning the sculpture is designed to make visitors feel like they are standing at the center of a hug. The artist who made the work, Hank Willis Thomas, said he sees it as a call to action and a call to love. King's granddaughter echoed that sentiment in an impromptu interview with NBC's Latoya Edwards as part of the unveiling ceremonies this past Friday, saying, the monument is like Love 360. We really need more love in the world. I hope we all feel that 360 of love that Yolanda Renee King referenced in the program today, and that that love will be the force, the call, for each of us to dig deeper as individuals and as a community in our work towards racial and social justice and belonging for all. Hello everyone, as Michelle mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Nolan Greer. I am the volunteer and community engagement manager for Spark Kindness. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all who have donated to our Snacks for Students Drive and a special thank you to both the elementary school 
front office staff and elementary PTOs for managing the drive. If you have not had an opportunity to donate and would like to make a financial donation after the program, please find the Spark table where you can scan a QR code and make a financial donation. I'd also like to cordially invite you to our com community connection event after the program right outside in the cafeteria. We will be highlighting organizations that are working to create, as Martin Luther King Jr termed a beloved community, one where everyone is cared for. So I hope that you can join us and learn about the important work of those organizations. Please enjoy the program. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Neera Mahesh, co-chair of Spark Kindness. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> Good morning again to everyone here and everyone at home. 54 years ago, on February 4th, 1968, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his sermon, The Drum Major Instinct, at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. It was an adaptation of the 1952 homily Drum Major Instincts by J. Wallace Hamilton, a well-known liberal white Methodist preacher. In his sermon, King acknowledges the fact that many people desire recognition. They desire to be first. He calls this the desire, the Drum Major Instinct but he proposes an alternative kind of ambition one can ch achieve through a life of service. Rather prophetically, Dr. King discusses in the conclusion what he would like to be said about him at his own funeral. Selections of this sermon were then played two months later after his assassination at his funeral service. I invite you to follow along with our readers today in your program booklet where excerpts are also printed. Thank you. There is, deep down within all of us, an instinct. It's a kind of drum major instinct, a desire to be out front, a desire to lead the parade, a desire to be first. And it is something that runs a whole gamut of life. We all want to be important, to surpass others, to achieve distinction, to lead the parade. The quest for recognition this desire for attention, this desire for distinction, is the basic drive of human life. This drum major instinct. And you know, we begin early to ask life to put us first. Our first cry as a baby was a bid for attention. Children ask life to grant them first place. They are a little bundle of ego and they are innately the drum major instinct. Now, in adult life, we still have it, and we really never get it, get by. We like to do something good, and you know we like to be praised to for it. Somehow, this warm glow we feel when we are praised or when we're, our name is in print is something of the vitamin A to our ego. Nobody is unhappy when they are praised, even if they know they don't deserve it. And even if they don't believe it, the only unhappy people about praise is when the praise is going too much towards somebody else. 
but everybody likes to be praised because of this real drum major instinct. There comes a time when the drum major instinct can, be, can become destructive. If this instinct is not harnessed, it becomes a very dangerous, pernicious instinct. For instance, if it isn't harnessed, it causes one's personality to become distorted. And the great tragedy of the distorted personality is the fact that when one fails to harness this instinct, he ends up trying to push others down in order to push himself up. And whenever you do that, you engage in some of the most vicious activities. You will spread evil, vicious, lying gossip on people because you are trying to pull them down in order to push yourself up. When you don't harness the drum major instinct, this uncontrolled aspect of it leads, leads to snobbish exclusivism. The drum major instinct can, live to, it can lead to exclusivism in one's thinking. It can lead one to feel that because he has some training, he's a little better than that person that doesn't have it. Or because he has some economic security, that he's a little better than the person who doesn't have it. And that's the uncontrolled perverted use of the drum major instinct. A lot of the race problem grows out of the drum major instinct, a need that some people have to feel superior, a need that some people have to feel that they are first and to feel that their white skin ordained them to be first. And they have said it over and over again in ways that we see with our own eyes. Think of what has happened in history as a result of this perverted use of the drum major instinct. It has led to the most tragic prejudice, the most tragic expressions of man's inhumanity to man. The nations of the world are engaged in a bitter, colossal contest for supremacy. This is why we are drifting. And we're drifting there because nations are caught up with the drum major instinct. I must be first. I must be supreme. Our nation must rule the world. And I'm sad to say that the nation in which we live is the supreme culprit. And I'm going to continue to say it to America because I love this country too much to see the drift that it has taken. Every now and then, I guess we all think realistically about that day when we will be victimized with what is life's final common denominator. That's something that we call death. We all think about it. And every now and then, I think about my own death. And I think about my own funeral. And I don't think of it in a morbid sense. And every now and then, I ask myself, what is it that I would want said? And I leave the word to you this morning. And if any of you around are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. And every now and then, I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Prize that isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or 400 other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for someone to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I would like you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that it did, did try to feed the hungry, 
to clothe those who were, oh, oh my gosh. Nope, uh, and I want you to be able to try to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in, who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love those, I uh, love and, what? I tried to love and serve humanity. There we go, there we go. <laughs> Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major. Say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I want to leave behind a committed life. And that is all I want to say. If I can't help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain.
Hello? Hello? Hello. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> our, our community. community. Our, our community, community is brimming with a multitude of contrasting, contrasting shades and tones paired with full features derived from our home, home continent. continent. Our community is fi filled of numerous personalities that connect back to our culture as a whole. Our community is a pool of resilient bodies that have received prejudice and judgment from the moment we were birthed into this world. However, However our, community our community does not let the same prejudice, judgmental opinions of ignorant, ignorant hateful beings, beings define us because we are strong. We are a race of people who have been considered the scum of the society but haven't stopped to continue flourishing and growing to change the narrative we were expected of. We are black children. Black mothers and fathers. Black grandparents and grandbabies. Black sisters and brothers. We have, have gone through hell more than we can count on our own hands. hands. But, but that, that has not stopped us. us. It has not stopped us, us to strive for more than what we were told we should be. Whether that be. Just another dead body on the street. A baby mama. Another rapper. We become more superior to the inferiority. We were boxed in by the handwork. We put, put forth, forth in, in our, our daily, daily lives. lives. But most importantly, we, we are, are a community. community. Oh, we are a community that gathers together to spread love within each other. We are a community that holds each other down so we can rise up. We are a community of strength, intelligence, resilience, and beauty. We are interconnected beings that represent a beautiful culture. We, we are, are the black, black community. community. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Anna, your school superintendent in the Natick Public Schools. And first, I just want to say congratulations to all the student performers, readers, musicians, and poets here today and artists. I'm just bursting with pride at all of your beautiful creative work. So great job. <clears throat> This week I've been contemplating um, the following quote. Education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to, res to assume responsibility for it. And Dr. King understood the importance of education in the fight for justice and equality and believed that through education we could change hearts and minds and create a more just and equitable society for all. And indeed I've made a life's work of working on that and I know that you are the partners that join us in that work. King said the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the true goal of education. Because education isn't just about acquiring knowledge, it's about developing thinking skills and empathy, and all of that is necessary to engage in the world around us and learning to love the world enough to take responsibility for it. Dr. King also said that the time is always right to do what is right. And we must use our education to take responsibility for creating a just and equitable world. And this is not a task for one person, one community, or one generation, but it is the task for all of us. So join me in honoring Dr. King's legacy by committing to education and thinking and taking responsibility for each other and our society. And together we create a world that lives up to King's words of darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that and hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. So symbols of active love and light in our Natick community are our Natick teachers and educators and advisors and leaders, many of whom are here today. <clears throat> many of those teachers have taught lessons, cultivated passions, and inspired our young people. And evidence of this work is apparent in the poems and the art piece of of our MLK contest winners that I will now announce. Our first winner is from Kennedy Middle School, and uh, her name is Gianna Macchiano, and she has created a, an art piece called What's Your Life's Blueprint?
What's Your Life's Blueprint? From MLK Jr.'s October 1967 speech to students at Barrett Junior High School in Philadelphia. And when you discover what you will be in your life, set out to do it as God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job. Set out to do such a good job that the living, the dead, and the, uh, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. If it fails your lot, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leontine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley. Be the best little shrub on the side of the hill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size what you, what you win or fail, but by whatever you are. When I decided to draw this portrait, I chose the boy under the, under the title of Powerful Portraits. I chose to draw him for his expression that spoke volumes of what his past or future might be like. This boy is a person with a life ahead of him, just like you and I. Whether he is black or white, poor or wealthy, hungry or full, he is human. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. saw humanity in every person and a life where we can accomplish incredible things. We are all human, and we each have a blueprint, just like Dr. King said. A blueprint that sets out our life, uh, sets out the path of our lives, guiding us to be our best selves. This boy can be whoever he wants, whatever he wants. So I implore you to become this boy through his strengths and his struggles, and follow the blueprint of your life. Our second winner <clears throat> is from the Wilson Middle School, and she has written a poem called Expectations. Welcome Sarah Vos from grade six at Wilson. Martin Luther King once said, number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodiness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Expectations drown people. Our lives are submerged with toxic stereotypes that are silently killing us. Be normal, be pretty, be smart, be funny, be what is expected, be what others want you to be, stay within the lines. But how do we think highly of ourselves when the words of our peers engulf us? When the blueprint society draws is the image we assimilate and the expectations of others is the only image we grasp. When we look in the mirror and see an imperfect person, one that can't meet society's expectations. But that perception of what we view can be changed if only we look at ourselves with open eyes, eyes that take in all the beauty we have, eyes that don't accept society's boundaries, but form new ones. Be the best, be what you want, be unique, be you. Expectations should not define us if we rephrase them, if we make our own rules, if we grasp our own image. Maybe millions of eyes will see the beauty that was always in them. We will feel our self-worth. We will feel our somebody. Society's expectations drown people until we decide to rewrite them.
There sure is a lot of wisdom in the room, right? <laughs> Our final winner is from Natick High School, Anna Vlasic from grade 10, who wrote a poem called Why Fly When You Could Swim. What I chose to expand on was, if you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or fail, be the best of whatever you are. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Why fly when you could swim? Would we find seashells just as beautiful without the sand underneath them, giving them a place to rest? Would we still love the sun without the humble stars waiting patiently behind it to shine in the night? Would we still see the stars without the night sky giving them a canvas to shine through? Too often do we get bruised from the fall of trying to fly when we know we cannot. We use the precious time we have been given to beat ourselves down for not being able to fly when we know we were never meant to reach the sky. But why can't we use the time we have been given to admire the softness of the grass underneath our feet instead of staring up into the sky? If we use the time we were given to appreciate what we have, we would not give a second thought to flying. We would be weaving wreaths with the grass seeing the autumn leaves as they land on the ground, letting our feet sink into the sand. We would give our time to the ground, making the most beautiful world if we were not so stuck on giving our time to the sky. So watch as the wind sweeps the fall leaves away. Dip your toes into the ocean and maybe even swim in it. And while you're doing that, admire the beauty of how the wind carries the birds through the air, but even more so, admire how the sand beneath the ocean is giving the water a place to rest and admire how the water is giving you a place to feel the, admire the ocean is giving you a place to feel the water on your skin. Thank you everyone, congratulations. Good morning. It's so great to see an auditorium filled with people for MLK Day again. So, so glad to be with you today. Um, my name is Katie Sugarman. I'm, I work in the Natick Health Department. I also um, help lead our Natick 180 Coalition here in town. And I have the very good fortune of introducing our keynote speaker today, Kevin J. McCarthy. 
Um, Kevin is a licensed independent clinical social worker, a psychotherapist, and a consultant who specializes in assisting people with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders as they find their pathways to recovery. He also serves as a part-time diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI, and anti-racism trainer, and a consultant for Human in Common. And that's the context in which I myself and a number of us here in Natick first encountered Kevin when he actually provided several trainings for us here in Natick over the past couple of years. Kevin inspired us, he educated us, he challenged us, um, and he brought warmth and humor to all of our conversations that really made the converse, that really made our discussions all the more meaningful. I'm sure you'll hear some of that same warmth and humor in his comments today. Kevin wears many hats, and I would encourage you to read his full bio in the program today, but you'll see in everything that he talks about that he considers himself centrally a social worker for social justice and a DEI change maker. Please welcome Kevin J. McCarthy to the stage. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Kevin John McCarthy. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. You know, it was talked about earlier about um, when he was talking about the drum major and all the roles. And one of the things that stood out for me, and I'm, I'm going off script, was uh, when one of the speakers talked about, you know, don't talk about my degrees and don't talk about what jobs I've done and, and don't talk about my titles. You know, I've got a friend of mine and a mentor, Hernan Hernandez, who says, it was harder for him to get a GE day in jail than it was for him to get a PhD outside. And that just speaks to the nature of our culture. And so I stand before you today saying it is an honor and a privilege to be at the 18th annual celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, I want to begin by thanking Katie Sugarman for a wonderful introduction and say thanks to Natick 180, the town of Natick, um, the Greater Natick Interfaith Clergy Association, Spark, and METCO, who I've had the opportunity to work with in the past, and I've had the privilege of working with ongoingly for their commitment to creating racial harmony and a beloved community here in the town of Natick. But my thanks also go out to the many other event partners that have made this day possible. You know, what's really wonderful to me is to see so many young people here today. You know, because you, you are our future. And you are the hope that Martin Luther King talks about when he talks about the beloved community. It will grow as a theme in your hearts, but it is up to you and the people in this room to manifest it into a reality in your community. A community where the love of God and family and thy neighbor is as of much importance is evidenced by the gathering here today. You know, as a licensed professional social worker, I've committed myself to a life of service. But that wasn't always the case. As a matter of fact, oh, about 13 years ago, if you went down Route 9 a little ways, there was a place called Lee Imported Cars, Volvo and Jaguar of Wellesley. And there I was trying to be that drum major. I was the general sales manager, I was top salesman. And I thought in my mind that I had arrived. I had worked in the automobile industry for almost 20 years. I was now running one of the local prestigious dealerships in high-end luxury vehicles because that was my goal. But you know, God had a different plan. I was doing the best anybody had ever done in that job, and yet I got fired for lack of competence. 
I wrote Chris Lee a letter some years later thanking him for making the best decision in my life for me. Because I left that job and I made a decision that like my family had taught me in the beloved community I was raised in, that a life of service was what I was born to. So I left that job and I, uh, I ended up going back to school. And that's the road that led me here. But you know something? This is something that didn't come to me then. It had been with me always. You see, I do this work now to continue a family legacy of service to community that was passed down to me from my grandparents to my parents. Much as the tradition of this celebration annually will be passed down to you young people from your grandparents and your parents and your families. And this celebration is being passed down to you, not by words, but by the deeds and actions of your families and the leaders in this community. You know, more specifically, the family legacy was passed down to me from my Aunt Doris. She was the younger sister of my mom, my mentor. And when I think about her, she invokes joy, and that's what these tears are about. Because, see, she was truly a social justice warrior. At the time when the civil rights movement was at its peak, and the concept of a beloved community was being created and taught by Dr. King. She was a leader in her church and in her community. My Aunt Doris was always involved. She was active in the NAACP locally and nationally. Like her parents, all she wanted to do was to create a community of love and support where all people could be included and accepted for who they are. Bell Hooks, who was an activist and author once said, beloved community is formed not by the eradication of difference, but by its affirmation, by each of us claiming the identities and cultural legacies that shape who we are and how we live in the world. It is time to celebrate the differences in life because that is what a beloved community is made of. Martin Luther King believed that his teachings were going to go on beyond him. You know, if you think about it, his speech from the mountaintop the day before he was assassinated was prophetic. He stood and he said, I may not get there with you. And I can sit in this room and say, I may not get there with you. But I will see you when you get to the mountaintop. See, what I learned about beloved community, I initially learned from my Aunt Doris and the teachings of Dr. King. I can remember growing up, and the members of our church told stories of Martin attending service while he was studying at BU. I remember being shown Polaroid pictures of young Martin sitting at a table eating from a paper plate. My aunt showed me these we listened, as we listened to his speeches. And it was that time in my life that I believed that someday, somehow, his dream would come true for me. And I too would be a community leader, an activist, just like my Aunt Doris. You see, Dr. King believed that the only way forward in America 
was through nonviolent, peaceful protest against all injustice and oppression and the coming together of all people regardless of race, creed, color, religion, or national origin. My favorite and one of his most popular quotes is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And the eradication of injustice is one of the goals of a beloved community. In 1956, in Buffalo, New York, King received the Alpha Award for honoring for Christian leadership and cause of first-class citizenship for all mankind. It was during this address that he declared the quote, we will have to rise up and protest in order to usher in a new age, a beloved community where all men will live as brothers together. And that was the beginning of a man who in 13 short years from 1955 till the time that he died in 1968, was able to move the civil rights and the rights of black people forward further than it had been in the 350 years preceding that. There's a reason why Dr. King is the only person that's not a president that has a statue on the commons in Washington, D.C., that we celebrate him today because what he did. You know, every time I think about the fact that he was assassinated, he was 39 years old. How many of us wish we did half of what he did in such short a time? But he was here with a purpose and a plan but he had a purpose and a plan to share with you an idea, an ideology, a future of America as a beloved community. And his goal was not to be here with us, was to leave that legacy to us so that we could carry out that goal of beloved community, not just here in America, but across the world. In his book, Brothers in Beloved Community, the right Reverend Mark Andrus wrote in his chapter on lineage of the beloved community, the beloved community is like a third character of a friendship. The very phrase attracts and inspires. We associate the beloved community with towering figures like Dr. King and John Lewis and Thich Nhat Hanh. But they're not the only ones. They are not the only ones. If we are to have a beloved community, that will be in your hands, in your future, be your responsibility. Dr. Said, Dr. King said that we will see the beloved community come together, and in that he meant you and I, our children, our grandchildren, and I believe that the beloved community is a creation that we are responsible for. Those of us in this room, those of us in so many other rooms celebrating his life today, those of us who had committed to carrying out his message of hope to our children and our children's children. I believe that beloved community starts with me. It starts with me because if those in my community are to be loved, then I am responsible for loving them. So if no one has told you yet this morning that they love you today. I want you to know that I love you and God loves you too. Dr. King said that we will see the beloved community together, not some from inordinate, inordinate superfluous wealth or others from abject and deadening poverty, not some white, not some black, 
not some yellow, red, brown, but all people shall see it together. But in order to build that beloved community, we must first break down the bondages of colonialism, exploitation, and imperialism. This is our responsibility as a community because the beloved community is within us. We are responsible for its creation. Our being here today is a symbol of that commitment, and for that I am grateful. To all of you, all of you who have shown up today, and more importantly, those of you who are our event partners who will continue to show up in the future to carry this message of hope to all people, no matter their identity, black, white, Jew, Gentile, European, Asian, African, and indigenous American. Living together as equals under God in a society where a person is measured in those memorable words by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. There are a number of you in this audience today who were called to write essays or poems or creative writing, and oh my God, I was blown away. You know, and you had four different quotes to choose from, from Dr. King's speeches. And I would like to, first of all, applaud all of you for just entering and taking the shot, because it was no easy task. I want to say congratulations to this year's winners. But you know something more importantly? I want to say thank you to those of you that didn't win, because it was you that set the bar of excellence so high that we heard what we heard here this morning. You know, from the four quotes, and thank you again, one stands out for me. And when you will discover what you will be in your life, set out to do so as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. And I told Katie that I wanted to be brief, and I said, give me an eye on time, because you know what? I, I, I have a close all ready to just crescendo, right? But after that, but after that quote, I want to throw in another 45 seconds and say, when I hear that quote, I hear about three significant points in my life. You see, I'm a person in long-term recovery. I'm sure that God welcomes your applauses because I had nothing to do with it. Okay? And I tell this story, rare, but when I tell it, the truth is I was on a road to destruction. I was on a path like an uncontrollable missile, I was the tornado that they talk about. But like Bill Wilson, I got that lightning bolt. One day, one place, it's unimportant where and when, a voice said to me, Kevin, look at yourself, you're killing yourself. And it wasn't my voice. And there wasn't anybody else in the room. And my ego shook that off until I heard it the second time. And that's the first time I was called, and that was to save my life. And I wrote a letter to, I, I talked about this, I wrote that letter to Chris Lee. Because you see, when he fired me, that was the second time. I got fired from a job that everybody loves. Every other dealership in the area wanted to scoop me up. I got job offers on a daily basis. And I sat with self, and God told me, you've got unfinished business. So I talked to my spiritual advisor, Father James Woods of Boston College. Oh yeah, I wasn't supposed to mention where I went to school, huh? And Father Woods said, Kevin, you've got a lot to offer. 
I'll write your recommendation if you go to the School of Social Work. And in 24 hours, I was sitting in front of the Dean of Admissions to the BC School of Social Work and trying to convince him that a 20-year car guy who was selling used cars the month before was a prime candidate to be a clinical social worker. <laughs> well, you all laugh. You will be surprised of the transferable skills from selling cars. <laughs> to psychotherapy. <laughs> I thought I was out of the business of getting to yes, but I'm still working at it. <laughs> and so see, those were key moments in my life when I know I had nothing to do with it. And that's why this quote's so important. God intervened and said, no, you're not going right, you're going left. Um, and today, I live by faith, not by sight. So I'm going to close by saying, I stand here before you today holding hope that you will keep the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King alive in the creation of a beloved community here within Natick. This theme has to be the bedrock and foundation of all of his speeches from the mid-50s till his death in 1968. Though he spoke about beloved community often as he nonviolently protested injustice in America, what will always resonate with me will always be these words. Our goal is to create a beloved community, and this will require a qualitative change in our souls, as well as a quantitative change in our lives. So I ask you to leave here today and think about that quote. What are you doing to make a change in your soul? And then what are you doing to make a change in your life that will make a change in the life of the next generation? I thank you for having me. I thank you for allowing me to share. I thank you for your celebration this morning and have a great rest of your day. I wanted to share with you a verse from the Hebrew Bible that Martin Luther King would often quote, including in his I Have a Dream speech, as something we can't be satisfied until we realize. From the prophet Amos, uh, the words are in your booklet, and I'll invite you to repeat after me. But let justice roll down like water. But let justice roll down like water, righteousness like a mighty stream, righteousness like a mighty stream. But let justice roll down like water, but let justice roll down like water, righteousness like a mighty stream, righteousness like a mighty stream. Ve'yigal kamayim mishpat, ve'yigal kamayim mishpat, utztaka kenachal etan, utztaka kenachal etan. But let justice roll down like water, but let justice roll down like water, righteousness like a mighty stream. Righteousness like a mighty stream. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon all of you. Thank you so much for allowing the Islamic Center of Boston Wayland to participate in this Martin Luther King Day celebration. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. We start in the name of God, 
the most beautiful names belong to God and we send peace and salutations to his prophets, to his family and to all the believers until the day of judgment. 1400 years ago, a man, a shepherd sitting atop the mountain of Arafat said that all mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab and a non-Arab has no superiority over an Arab. A white person has no superiority over a black person, nor a black person has any superiority over a white person, except by their piety and good action. This was the Khutbatul Wida, or the last sermon of Prophet Muhammad. May the peace and blessings be upon him. It is lamentable indeed, and I would like today perhaps to first admonish my own brothers and sisters, the Muslims of this world, that 1,400 years later, we have not made further progress on this very simple premise that we are all created equal. Almost 60 years ago today, the man who we are commemorating then reminded us that he had had a dream. I have a dream, he said, that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Echoing almost the words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 1400 years prior. It should not have taken the lives of George Floyd or all the other blessed lives that have been lost in the pursuit of justice and equality. We pray to the Almighty Lord to help us people and as a generation rise to this moment and fulfill what Prophet Muhammad taught us and what Martin Luther King Jr. then reminded us that we are all brothers and sisters and the equal creation of God. We ask him to make us righteous and give us the courage to stand for what is right and to never waver from it. When faced with great adversity, the seven sleepers of Ephesus prayed a very beautiful and profound prayer that is apt for us now. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً وَحْيَئْ لِنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا O Lord, pour your mercy upon us and guide us to the best in our affairs, the best judgment in all that we do, in all of the affairs that we undertake. We ask the good Lord to help us in the pursuit of justice and equality and to protect us and our parents and our children in this time. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen Wa Akhri Dawana Anilhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Hi, my name is Ian, and I want to thank you all for being here to affirm our common dream of beloved community that MLK so eloquently spoke of and so eloquently lived. And I'm just so grateful for all the creativity and faith and commitment to justice that all of you in this room share. So I want to thank you. It's such a hopeful time. And as our speaker reminded us, to reach our goal of the beloved community requires both the quantitative and the qualitative dimension. So I would like to ask you to make a quantitative donation <laughs> in the baskets as they come around. I think that's the plan. Or also you could donate online at the link in the bulletin and that will help us keep this vital event going. But then I also want you to consider your donation a down payment on the qualitative dimension, the gift of living the dream of your heart and joining together as a community to create the beloved community here in Natick. It is our responsibility and I thank you all for being here and showing that you care. Thank you.
I'm Reverend Alicia Reeves Freeman from Fitz Memorial United Methodist Church here in Natick, where God is always present. As we leave this space to get the greatest attention you want and the lasting recognition you deserve, may the God of Creator of all of humanity bless each of you as we go out to do all the good that we can to all the people that we can, by all means we can, and in all places, and at all times. But most of all, may that creator also let us be the advocate for, and the presence of love, peace, justice, and equality that the world needs now more than ever before until we all meet again. Thank you.